phenomena of single, dual, triple, and maybe even quadruple textual histories of certain Ethiopic Old Testament books. And we're going to look uh, very narrowly at a case study uh, with regard to the Ethiopic Song of Songs. Uh, so these are the bases we'll touch along the way. Um, to give some context for our study, we are part of the uh, FAIR project, Textual History of the Ethiopic Old Testament, in which uh, research partners from around the world are uh, engaging together to uh, uh, sort out the textual history of uh, as many of the books of the Ethiopic Old Testament as we can. Our goal is to transcribe and study a sample of shared variants in at least 30 manuscripts of every book of the Ethiopic Old Testament. So first of all, what we do is have Kurt Nickham identify a set of sample passages in the book known because there are variants in at particular locations between the Hebrew and Greek. Syriac, Arabic, uh, so that we can tech, check out the textual history in relation to external uh, uh, other versions. And then also, uh, because there are hot spots of inner Ethiopic variation at these points. So we'll, we identify maybe 15% of long books, or sometimes we do entire books, uh, to do transcriptions. And uh, through a very careful process of transcribing then, we get a data set with which we're able to identify families of manuscripts, characterize the apparent agenda behind each of the text forms of the text, provide a sketch of the textual history of the <coughs> book, and map out the work that needs to be done uh, after that. This particular uh, um, assignment on the Song of Songs falls to uh, the three of us. Uh, uh, Tekla Balachu is, uh, resides in Addis and uh, is working with uh, Jared and I. Uh, on uh, the Ethiopic Song of Songs, which turned out to be just a doozy of a case. <laughs> and we'll find out here in a bit. And we didn't rig that, uh, it just turned out that way. <coughs> so, uh, the emergence of the question. We started into this thing, the Song of Songs uh, has the distinction of being the most copied book in the Ethiopic tradition. You might imagine it would be the Psalms, but you'd be wrong, because for every Psalms, every copy of the Psalms, there is a corresponding uh, uh, Song of Songs. The, the third of the five books that make up a Psalter is always uh, the Song of Songs. And it's copied not only in Psalters, but also in uh, uh, parts of the, uh, let me see, in, um, uh, so where else yeah, is it here? Yeah, Gavrilamalat. <laughs> yeah, Gavrilamalat. Uh, the, the Solomon Corpora. Uh, so it gets copied more than anything else, and even more than the, the Psalms. It's part of the Psalter. Uh, there was an edition that was produced some years ago by Glebe and finished by SR Driver. But as we're going to see this morning, we know why. We're able to answer why it is that that edition had problems, because it wasn't aware of the of the landscape that we're going to be able to map out here today. Um, and uh, I work, have worked for a number of years now with uh, 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 <coughs> both uh, Gitachi Pilate, but also more frequently, uh, Kisus Malaku Terefe, an Ethiopian Orthodox priest in uh, Los Angeles. And we have worked creating metadata entries on Ethiopian <coughs> manuscripts to, to the tune of probably 8,200 entries across the last five years. We've done several books, uh, published several books together. And in the, uh, the process of doing that, began to catch a wind that maybe there was two editions, two recensions, uh, actual arms of goodness recensions of Ethiopic Song Songs. Uh, so we started to take a closer look. Um, so the uh, Song of Songs issue, you probably are aware, it's the third of the five works that make up Psalters. Uh, we also began uh, to, uh, to look at um, the occurrences where the Song of Songs appears in biblical manuscripts, narrowly defined, uh, as uh, containing the Solomonic corpus. So Song of the Songs is also included in those books. And uh, we became aware that it's part of the readings of the, the lectionary for Holy Week, uh, the Saturday morning readings, the Gavrahabadon manuscripts. And uh, very recently in the research process, became aware that it may also be a standard part of Ginzet manuscripts or, or a funeral rituals. So there you have the same book being transmitted though for, uh, the, the, for usage in very different social locations. 
so there's a whole aspect that we won't get into this morning because we're just going to tell the story of the manuscripts. But uh, uh, it's interesting in part because these are different social locations in the life of the church. And uh, uh, the form that the text takes, if that changes from location to location, that would in itself be quite an interesting set of findings. Um, we begin to get this inkling that there is a shorter uh, uh, common type to the Song of Songs and a longer recension referred to by some folks within the tradition as the Hebraic edition uh, that had some additional lines. We'll be able to get very precise numbers of that in just a little bit. So uh, we said, we got a project here, let's go after it. And uh, Jared's going to tell us about how we went about doing that. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about how we designed our project, and then Steve will come back up and give you some of the conclusions for us. So just like all of our projects in Fayot, we have a certain set of criteria, and I want to talk a bit about those. First, we need a sample of the different types of manuscripts and of the different recensions. So we want to make sure we have representatives from both of those. Further, we need a full sample of the extant tradition from the 14th to the 20th century. So we have to select manuscripts that cover that range. And then third, we need to reach a magic number of 30. So I'll go into a little bit more detail of each of these. So types and recensions, like Steve mentioned, there are four types, uh, Psalter, Biblical, Lectionary, and Funeral. For this project, we just uh, have done the three. So that's the kind of preliminary approach here. We want to add in Funeral in the next stage. And further, we have representatives from the longer and shorter recensions so that we can try to tell those stories as well. <coughs> we also uh, attempt to have a, the widest chrono chrono chronological sample as possible. So we see here just the basic data, 14th through the 20th, and representatives from each of those. And then over here, um, we have our chart, and I'll get into more detail of that in a moment. But the magic number 30, so this is, this is really a significant number for our research. Uh, and it has a lot to do with sampling. So obviously there's a lot of manuscripts out there, right? There is just keep growing and growing, this number keeps growing, but we can't study all of them. So what we want to do is get a sample of them. That represents the whole. Uh, so we ask the question, what portion of the whole is needed to produce a representative sample? Do we need 50%, 1%, or is there a certain number that guarantees or uh, suggests that we have a representative sample? And the answer to that is 30. And we've come to that conclusion from two different directions, both based on experience from the team. So as an example, when one group has 15 manuscripts, we get a large view of the picture. But when we bump that up to 30, the details start to fill in. But when we go further beyond that and go to 50, nothing significant changes in the overall picture. So we become confident through experience that 30 is the, the ideal number. Right? It's not too much work, but it's enough that we have a, a representation of the whole picture. But coming from it a different direction, uh, statistics tell us that 30 is a significant number when we're talking about sampling. And uh, an author, Guy, says N equal 30 is the approximate <coughs> dividing line between large and small samples. And he has shown this through statistical analysis. Uh, and this means that an N of 30 gives a confidence level, level of 95% that a sample is representative of its whole. So if you take 30 represent, representatives from any large number, then we have a confidence level that those 30 are going to represent the overall picture. And that confidence level is 95%. And 95%, again, is another statistical marker of, uh, of relevance. So if you can get up to that confidence level, you can have a certain confidence in your work. And you can see the biblio bibliographic reference for that there. So we're, we're comfortable, we're confident with this number, both based on experience, but also statistical analysis tells us that 30 is the one to hit. So we've done that. In fact, we went up to 32. You see them all listed here um, according to type as well as according to recension. So we have our Psalters, both the short and long recension. We have a lectionary for Holy Week, and then we have biblical. So altogether, we have 30, although our goal was to have 30 for each of these. Uh, so as we continue to move forward, we want to continue to grow our database. Uh, but for the global picture, having 30 overall gives us a general sense of what is taking place. So these are the manuscripts that we've been working with. And I'll talk a bit about our methodology in approaching these manuscripts, although it's been presented in some other contexts. So I'll go through it rather quickly. So the discovery process. We transcribe all 32 of our witnesses. We put them into a Word document. 
And then we compare our transcriptions, making sure that our transcriptions are without error. And then we start to put this data into, uh, into groups, grouping our witnesses. So I got a little video that shows the whole process. This process takes a year, but I'm gonna show it in about two and a half minutes, and I'll try to uh, compensate along the way. <laughs> Something that we can do for uh, I'll have to mine it out or use it. The video is there. It's just yeah, um, it, is it in this folder? And I think that's the problem. So Steve is pulling it up. In the Word document, we just have each witness uh, parallel of it by line, right? So each line for each witness is just laid out. And then we'll go for variation points. Uh, here we see just looking at the places where the manuscripts are at variance with one another, bumping them out. And then we can organize the witnesses according to group based on these places of variation. And you'll see that happening right here. So each group is assigned a number and that number is tagged onto each witness. And then each witness's number is placed into this massive database that we've collected. And then we have these scripts that Gary Jost has put together for us that analyze these data points. We have hundreds and hundreds of data points and it compares those looking for similarity and differences. You get these fancy colors that help draw the eye into the places of real significance for us. But even this here is difficult for us to interpret. So once it's done doing all the coloring, there's a few more steps that really produces the magic for us and gives us a visual representation of all of this data. And uh, it's produced in a dendrogram, which is really the place that the, the human mind can start to comprehend the massive data that we've collected. So we have 32 witnesses, they're all grouped according to different variations, and uh, hundreds and hundreds of data points. But what do we do with that? Well, it's put into a dendrogram, and this is a real excellent visualization of how manuscripts cluster together based on variation. So we can use this to find places uh, uh, where groups cluster or manuscripts cluster and assign families and then we can analyze those families looking for specific places where they're different. This dendrogram is really interesting because it's just consistent with our other dendrograms, right? So in a previous session we noted that very high up on our differentiation scale, one manuscript almost always finds itself as an outlier. So very high up we see that happening here with uh, MML 2064. <coughs> Then we see in most of our dendrograms as we work with these texts, two main groups. So all of them will cluster up on one fork. So we have our two main groups. And then those groups will cluster into families. And we can see all of that happening here. So we've highlighted the forks and I'll talk about each of the major forks. We also see the places where our scripts have identified um, manuscripts that are representative of that family, the ideal representative manuscript. So all this is very useful information and I'll go into some detail. Uh, the issues that are raised by this dendrogram first is 4A just has one manuscript against everything else. I'll talk about that in a bit. And then second, 4B has two major clusters and I just mentioned that and that's very <coughs> consistent across the tradition. 4F has two families, so we'll go ahead and talk about 4F in more detail. And 4G also has two families. So I'll start with 4A. And this is the highest one up on the differentiation scale. EMML 2064 stands alone. And we wonder why, we wonder what's going on there. And to answer that question, we need to know where this manuscript is different from all the other manuscripts. And again, we use scripts to answer this question. The computer just analyzes all the information for us and pushes out a, quite an extensive list of uh, variation units, TVUs, that are distinctive for this manuscript. So the ones in light blue are places that are kind of medium power TV use for us. It's where uh, this one manuscript has its own reading and against mm -hmm. all the others, but maybe there's all the others don't agree, right? So this is kind of medium weight TVU, but this dark blue one is perfectly ideal for what we're trying to do. Where our 2064, of course, has its own reading, but all the other manuscripts agree against it. Right? So this is very valuable in differentiating 2064 from everything else. And you'll notice as we look through these, a very consistent pattern of uh, one manuscript having a reading and the other manuscripts being big cats. Right? So it's a common occurrence as there are different uh, additions and omissions from this text. All right, so we'll talk in, or Steve will give a more detailed account of this. So let's go ahead and talk about 4B. 
So are all the other manuscripts separated into two clusters? This work divides the manuscript into four main families, although there are a few outliers. <coughs> we ask ourselves, at what point can we differentiate these two clusters? And again, we have a uh, chart that is produced. Most of the differentiation is between big cat lines and I mean, the other cluster has a region there. Right? So this is what distinguishes the two clusters. But every once in a while, the two clusters differentiate based on a single word or a phrase where they have variant readings. Uh, all right, so for G, so this is a subcluster and it uh, breaks up into two families. This one has the, the two main families of this fork contain all the Hebraic manuscripts <coughs> except for EMML 2064 and one other. So all the Hebraic are on this side of our pentagram. So they all cluster together except for just two. Further, uh, some biblical as well as lectionary manuscripts are found in, in these families. So there's a mixing of, uh, of text types within the families, which is a really key point. And these two families do not contain any Psalter manuscripts. So we have the Hebraic on one side, except for a couple exceptions, and we have the Psalter on the other side of this fork. Okay, so that's one of the key findings of our work. And again, this is the place where the two families are differentiated between themselves, and Steve will talk in more detail about this. But I'll just note that the lot of them, it, again, it's just based on uh, big cap readings as opposed to additional lines or additional phrases. And then finally, we have uh, Fork F. Fork F has two main families as well, and it contains all the Psalter manuscripts, as I mentioned. And it also contains lectionary and biblical manuscripts uh, and just one Hebraic. So as large of a, a cluster this is, there's only one Hebraic found in it. Although that one manuscript is interesting and it's begging for us to look into it and see why it's clustering over here and not with all the other Hebraic manuscripts. So in order to do that work, we can go ahead and take a look at these different places where these manuscripts cluster together. And again, these are the prime readings that will help us to tell the story And to tell part of that story, and Steve will come back up. So this is a very odd way to sort of look at the phenomena of the thing. Say, so why don't you just look at the text and to try to get your mind around what all these numbers mean? It, it's taken us quite a while to learn how to work with the scripts and understand the nature of the data. But here's another uh, very obvious way. Let's just look at a doc file in which I started out with Gleaves base text. Gleaves base text has essentially every, every uh, Gleaves base text is all these lines that don't have color on them. So uh, you can just look up <coughs> here and you see uh, what, th that's sort of the common version of the uh, Ethiopic Song of Songs. They say, what are all those green lines? All those green lines are distinct added strokes that appear in one manuscript, that very, very old EMML 2064 manuscript. Uh, what are these ones that have uh, the blue? Well, uh, this one right here that has only the blue, that's ones that the so-called Hebraic edition or what we're gonna call here the mid-sized recension. Uh, uh, and the ones that have both green and blue, those are shared in common by that EMML 2064. <coughs> and uh, so the very long recension, the middle size recension, and then the common version. And here then you can get a, you can see exactly the nature of the relationship of these recensions to one another. It's a matter of additional strokes. Okay, the common version has the lead. So let's now look at that graphically and you can see uh, the short recension has 363 strokes in it. Uh, the medium size recension has 436 strokes, so a full 81 strokes beyond the common version. And uh, the granddaddy of them all is the 484 strokes, uh, <coughs> which is 48 unique strokes, but also 31 single or two word phrases additional uh, to everything else. So these are not substantial, these are not insubstantial differences between these recensions. I'm actually willing to use the word recension and not merely form of the text or something. This is on a Richter scale of a significant difference. This is pretty substantial. So uh, uh, we find the short recension in hundreds and hundreds, indeed thousands of psalters. This is the common version, uh, a short version of the Song of Songs. 
We find, interestingly, the medium version in dozens of Psalters, as we're going to see, there's a particular set of scriptoria, Metalek, Zadit II, and Selassie scriptoria, which seem to specialize in Psalters with this medium-sized recension in it. But there are also some biblical manuscripts, that is to say, books that contain the Solomon Corpus, that contain this medium-sized recension as a part of those biblical manuscripts, and even a uh, Gavrahimamot manuscript that contains this recension in it. That was completely unexpected in our findings, and that was really quite interesting. And then we're back to this one single manuscript, the MML 2064, that uh, represents the long recension. And of course, what makes this the interesting, what, how does a uh, text uh, critical uh, magic works based on these two, Lectio Deficili or Lectio Breve? The more difficult reading is likely to be the more original, and the shorter reading is likely to be. So if I asked you, which is the short, which is the oldest recension, according to that dogma, you would say, this is the oldest one, additions were made here, yeah. but in actual fact, it's on its head, because this thing is, is a 14, uh, well, the, the paleographers in the group, uh, uh, I'll show a picture here in a bit, and we'll take a look, yeah, that seems very clearly to be a 14th century, so it's, uh, the mystery just it increases then, how is it that the very oldest manuscript, or among the very oldest manuscripts, is this long recension, and then a medium-sized recension that contains everything that's in the long one, but for some reason apparently abbreviated, and then the common version that has even less stuff. This is just sort of counterintuitive uh, to text critical thinking. So uh, when we look at uh, the common version, uh, it is among the oldest manuscripts. So the very earliest manuscripts we have, there's a strata there that bear witness to the common uh, recension, the short recension. So it is present. It's the first thing we have to say. It's uh, it's it's antiquity uh, of the common version uh, is is undisputed. It's there right from the very outset. But uh, we also see that there's an old <coughs> uh, an old minority family and the mainstream family. So I sh should have the demogram here again. But uh, within the common version, there's two branches, and one is the chronologically bounded, very old, 1450 like earliest extant or what used to be called <coughs> Old Ethiopic, uh, maybe is one witness to that, and then this big bulge of common uh, edition ones. So it's old, it's the majority, um, and in the, the text is very, very stable across time. Any, all of the textual historical studies we've done in the Psalter itself, Canticles, as well as now Song of Songs, show a remarkable stability uh, of the text across time, uh, and um, this bears witness to that. Uh, and this main recension is known to Ethiopians, copied in most books, and is uh, the main one. EMML 2064 uh, gives us a glimpse of the roots of the long recension. So here's the here's the first image uh, of. Uh, um, and you can. Is there a date in this? Uh, I'm sure. I don't think there's a problem. But yeah, so we can sit here and have a discussion about paleography. There's no way to make this 16th century or later. The only question is, is it 14th or 15th? And uh, it's got a number of the indicators that are point mm -hmm. earlier in that, in that uh, scheme uh, rather than later. So it's an honest to goodness, really old manuscript among the very, very oldest. And it's just this phenomenal long recension that's got all these additional strokes uh, in it. Um, and uh, the nature of the, so this doc just has uh, English translation of the additional strokes. And you can see that they are of a sort uh, with uh, uh, the general content of the Song of Songs. And they have yet to do a full analysis, but obviously that would be a, a really interesting study to see what uh, additional, are some of them Christological? Uh, and uh, uh, in other, what other ways did they, visualize and, and recast or add definition to the story of the Song of Songs and its content. Uh, again, uh, I just flash a few things and I don't have time to go into trying to characterize the nature of these editions. But it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating set of, uh, of editions. Uh, 
So the media size recension, we have one more data piece, a story to tell uh, about this one that's quite interesting. Because there's a, we've learned uh, the marks of the Menelik, Zabitu, Selassie, Scriptoria, in part because they are the most recent. So uh, Menelik is uh, late 19th century, then Zabitu, and then Selassie from 1930 to 1974. Uh, and one of the standout character markers are these very, very distinctive Harrocks. You just spot them a mile away. Uh, open up the book, there's one staring at you, and you don't even have to ask a question, particularly if they have this yellow highlight, that's the Selassie, or excuse me, this white highlight uh, in, in the thing. That's a very distinctive Selassie. Uh, but, and it's very akin to Menelik uh, ones, uh, but Menelik ones are just a slightly less vivid, a less, slightly less colors. But uh, again, there's enough solidarity between them that they really stand out. Uh, other ecological features, if you see, if, I, if I'm in a, a book dealer's place and I just look at the end of the book and see this, say, Government Scriptorium, uh, we just learned across time that this is another of the marks, this artistic, so this is a functional the headband and tailband to make two fixing points at the top and the bottom that add to uh, the four uh, Coptic chain stitches and bridle attachment to the board that help secure the book, particularly when you've done a leather binding on the thing. So th this is braided leather, uh, pieces of leather, and uh, in the government scriptorium, they go one step beyond functionality towards aesthetic uh, quality, and this is an interesting thing in cosmological circles when scribal schools do that. And uh, this is another one of the characteristics that makes these manuscripts stand out, and they share these kind of characteristics. So, uh, and here's, uh, this is a whopper of a manuscript. First time I sat with Katachio Haile and we were going through cataloging manuscript images and we came to this page, uh, this book belonged to the King of Kings Menelik. He turned to me and he said, well, first of all, this kind of, this kind of writing, this backward, uh, you know, you write around the letters and emerging, that's very, very rare. Uh, and to see this uh, stamp of the Minister of Pen and to see this thing and it contains uh, uh, land transactions in folios in the front. It makes it, he actually turned to me and said, Steve, this is a national treasure in Ethiopia. And I had a tr the pleasure at the one point uh, of taking this book, Psalter, back to uh, Ankabar and delivering it to uh, the patriarch, uh, Archbishop of, uh, of Shoah. Uh, and uh, uh, sort of came full circle. So this thing, there's no question about whether it's uh, made the Gunther Scriptorium represented that highest uh, 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 niche in the social order. And uh, it contains uh, this medium-sized recension. recension. And um, there's <coughs> such an association when you, and that Gaber Heimamot manuscript is another example. It's, it that has, that contains this medium-sized recension, the longer recension, uh, is also very clearly from the scriptorium and has um, uh, a colophon, extensive colophon, uh, makes it clear it's a word in the ministry of pen, and uh, uh, it makes you wonder, is there some agenda going on in the Menelik, Zabitu, Selassie scriptory that says, our Song of Songs, we're ready to make an assertion to that this is an ancient form of the text that's distinctive to us, and we're gonna begin to push it. So. Uh, at least not all of the Psalters that are made in the government scriptorium have the longer recension, but we document at least 25 that do, and that's uh, actually a quite a substantial percentage. Uh, so something seems to be going on there, we don't know exactly what. But uh, overall, it's just uh, this fascinating story that we feel like now we've mapped the general territory, and now instead of just 30 manuscripts that cover all four of those text types, we need 30 of each, uh, to continue on to uh, the next part of the story. Thank you for your attention. We'll take uh, some questions. Yeah. Thank you. As I say, what we've got one paper that's not going to be given, so we have a little bit of slack in the in the system. So we've got a little bit of time for questions. So anybody? Uh, tell a little bit about the, the ease or difficulty in getting manuscripts from each of those four different. So the ease or difficulty, we got uh, lots and lots of image sets these days. Our project, the Ethiopic Manuscript Community Project, has uh, digitized about 10,500 manuscripts, and uh, 
Uh, some of those are from collections in Ethiopia, others of those are manuscripts that have come to North America. So to, we've got just literally thousands. I mean, when I do a study of the changing dimensions of Ethiopian psalters, uh, 1,080 psalters we consulted between our collection and ones in the EMML. So we just have, it wasn't difficult to come up with that minimum number, and it won't be difficult actually to come up with 30 of almost each of them. So there's, that, there's no need to go outside of already the, the database that, that, that we have. Re between what we have in-house and then what we can get uh, through cooperation with Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, uh, which is then access to the 9,600 manuscripts of the EMML database or microfilms, then you know, we can get the information we need. Yes, sir. Um, very related question. Um, um, given that the, the, the spread of manuscripts around the whole country, live alone, uh, which, are the, which are abroad, but in every single cathedral and everywhere, how much do you think is this is representative as exhaustive uh, of ma manuscripts are concerned? These demographics of uh, the, how many psalters, uh, or yeah. how many of the songs? Yeah, I mean, still, still there are also many <coughs> manuscripts are owned by individuals, uh, used to be, and yes. uh, yeah. kept uh, home and all those things. Uh, how much can we think that uh, we have collected uh, the manuscripts or included in, in, in this system? Oh yeah, uh, I, um, Richard Pankhurst had a, I think he proposed maybe 500,000. I'm ready to say there are probably a million in the country <laughs> or something. Because the numbers uh, estimated outside the country, his estimates were a third, a quarter to a third of what we actually know now. Uh, so there's just lots and lots of manuscripts. Again, the question, how many do you need before you can extrapolate? So you can draw some conclusions. They say a representative sampling suggests that, uh, that these are the demographics. If you had all the Psalters and you checked them all, you'd come up with 38% or something, or, or 22%. Um, in this case, we didn't talk much about the biblical manuscripts that, that have the Solomon Corpus and the Song of Songs. Three of those manuscripts had the medium-sized version, and they're older than the Melek Zadiktu Selassie script, or they're 18th century biblical manuscripts. So, so that medium-sized recension is around. Uh, but uh, the business about the type speaks to social locations. So people who are reciting the text, it's much more likely that they're going to need the common version. Uh, and in monastery, where is this work with this medium-sized recension going on? Uh, it's in uh, people, biblical manuscripts, as you know, you don't find them in the churches. You find them in monasteries. And their provenance, the people who work with those are wrestling with the meaning of the text. The church is, is reciting, right, you know, by, by rote, but not with the sort of comprehension that you had. It's in the monasteries where, they're, where the text, the biblical text, uh, is being worked over and revised. And uh, uh, so I'm not sure yeah, if I sure. got the other question. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, can I ask about the nice decorative frame that we saw in the uh, 15th century image. Um, can you tell us whether that is typical of uh, the pages of the Song of Songs? Is it, is it unique to the Song of Songs? <coughs> is it unique to our Psalters, uh, etc.? So there are 18 opportunities in the Ethiopian Psalter to put a harag, a major section divider, uh, one between every book, and then 10, uh, the, the Psalter is divided itself into 10 sections every 10. Uh, psalm, not at the number zero, but at the number one. So the 21st Psalm and the, the 31st Psalm and so on and so forth. So those are the places where scribes put harags. Uh, and uh, it's very typical. You don't have the full array always in the manuscript, but if you're going to have them, you're going to have them at least the five, uh, excuse me, the four books, uh, because on Kassabur Han, Gate of Light often doesn't have its own separate harag. But uh, this encompassing kind, where it comes down to size, this is quite unique to much older manuscripts. And you don't, you usually just see uh, uh, heavier type harags later from the 18th century on. Uh, it's, it's 
quite rare to see if it is less pattern. I'm interested in exact what you did in Insula. Uh, I uh, English and uh, Irish. Uh, very uh, yes. Uh, uh, so it's um, an <coughs> art story. I think it's easier to Anglo Saxon than it clearly isn't. Uh, it clearly isn't. Yeah. Can I come into that? Yeah. I think there's, there's some evidence that the Irish monks um, learned some of their tradition from people connected with Egypt. And so there actually might be a, a physical connection between, because of course Ethiopians and Egyptians had some quite a lot of interaction. So there is a at least a theoretical connection between them, which is fascinating. They uh, they recently found a Coptic manuscript uh, in Ireland, clearly printed by uh, uh, made by Irish monks. Right, yeah. right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, oh, I got a question. One, one more question. Have you come across any interesting colophons on um, that? Because you said this is the most uh, copied book, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, does it? Have you come across any stories before Song of Solomon that might try and place it somewhere in their um, prized history of, of Solomon um, ascendancy? Mm -hmm. Not within biblical manuscripts or psalters uh, that might be in uh, legends and other Cabernegas uh, uh, and that sort of thing. Right, Cabernegas. Hmm? Um, so there's an Andante commentary mm -hmm. on it. Uh, there are, there's quite extensive parts of the Kabbalah that quote yeah. quite short passages of um, the Song of Solomon. We looked at them because I, I looked through them because they turn out to be uh, verses that are not of particular interest in in your case. We, we maybe need to revisit that now. You've done more detail, but uh, we, we did look through the Kabbalah to see. Um, <coughs> It's also a, the, the Song of Solomon comes up time and time again all the way through the commentary tradition as a source of illumination and uh, explanation for completely unrelated texts, uh, but the imagery is often used. So. Yeah. That's that. Thank you. <coughs> when, when you, com you compare texts, for example, from Brodicy period or Menace period or Hadislati period, do you, do you sort of like take several texts from the Brodica period or, and several from the Slatter period? Because in Brodica period, um, for example, Songs of Solomon might be being copied in different places, yeah. uh, in north, south, yes. downward, and central Ethiopia, and so on. Yeah. And all have different approaches, all may have different approaches. Exactly. Yeah. And that we. For, to answer that question, we have too small of a sample uh, of just seven or even 14 of those manuscripts that would be relevant for answering that. We need to do 30, if we can find 30 of the Hebraic Psalters and then 30 of the Common Version Psalters and have enough of them in the 20th century that we can start to get a feel for the demographics and if there are indeed other ones from the 20th century that do not reflect the characteristics of the scriptoria nor the text of that uh, medium length uh, recension, then that'll give us an idea that this phenomenon is localized, centered in, uh, in one place in the country, but there are other places in the country where other things are going on. And I actually expect that result, but we don't have the data yet to substantiate any claims. So that's a really significant thing with the number 30, that for each question you ask, you need a new set of 30, right? Mm -hmm. So five manuscripts won't answer that question. If we want to study the 20th century, we need 30 manuscripts from the 20th century. But that, those 30 manuscripts may have come from one place, exactly. and they may not be representative. Yeah, so if we want the broad range, we need 30 from each of the places, okay. right, from each of the, the traditions. Yeah, so we'd be quite intentional to make sure that as best we could, we got a representative. Mm -hmm. So 16th century, uh, we have so few manuscripts, and a whole bunch of them are gundi, gundi. That sometimes contaminates our view of the 16th century. Uh, because all of our sample is from Gundi Gundi, and that then sort of ruins that random sampling. It becomes just a specialized problem. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. The next paper is uh, 